respond. And so we expect, presumably, to have some kind of discernible response in terms of their numbers or their nesting success or their something or other of uh, the birds to this control work that's been going on. Now, I will say, um, caveat, uh, <laughs> it's really hard to measure all those things. And we are not looking at nesting success, for example. We're not finding nests and monitoring how many chicks hatch or anything like that. So we're, we're limited in simply trying to estimate the abundance of these species. Um, it would be great if we get even more money some year to really go in and try to find the nests and look at nest success, but we are not doing that. Um, whoops, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. All right. So sacred of marsh birds, this is a subset of birds. Of course, marshes have many, many bird species that live in them. Things like red-winged blackbirds and, and herons are feeding in them, although typically not nesting in them. We're not looking at all the species that occur in marshes. We're looking at the ones, the, this habitat, where there's some open water, some patches of different types. They really like the patchiness. Um, along with having the vertical stems. Now, all, this suite of species is rare and declining. The species that we monitor for are all listed in the, as species of greatest conservation need in the state. Three of them are actually also state listed as state endangered. Um, and the thing about them is that they're poorly sampled by bird, standard bird monitoring techniques. Uh, birds. Um, are probably the best studied group of wildlife simply because they're very visible, they sing, um, they're active in the daytime, <laughs> they don't hide as much as other things like salamanders or whatever. Um, so typically bird population monitoring is, is sort of better, there's better quality data available in general for birds and other things. And this is the group of birds that's the exception to that general pattern in that they are very poorly sampled because they live in these habitats that are relatively inaccessible to people and they are active at night primarily, they're calling at night, and they're so easily overlooked um, that it's really hard to get a, tap, get a handle on how many of them there are out there. So we do follow a specialized survey protocol to try to assess their um, presence in these habitats. Um, what, so there is a sort of a national level standard protocol used for this suite of birds. And we uh, are hoping to, we monitor for eight of these species. Um, the species that we look for are listed off to the right. Um, American coot, it's the one with the white bill on the front. It looks almost duck-like, you'll see it around. We get lots of them during migration, very few during the actual nesting season here. So if we don't do this monitoring during migration season, we're really just looking at the nesting populations here at the park. Um, pied bill grebe is another one. Least bittern. Um, Sora, which is a rail um, that has a yellow bill on front. Um, this is the common gallinule. It's got a red, sometimes some yellow on the bill. And then Virginia rail is another small rail. Um, we all, I don't have pictures here. American bittern and king rail are the other two species that we do monitor for. And I won't be saying much about them because we have yet to detect them here in the park. It would be great. We throw them in here because we hope we'll get them someday. But <laughs> We, we may not, we'll see. So the protocol, um, you gotta get out, so we have a whole series of points, I'm gonna show you a, a map in a minute, locations out in the marsh, or adjacent to marsh, um, where we survey from. So you get to go to a point, you have to do that within three hours of dawn, preferably uh, within two hours of dawn. Um, and the first step of the protocol is you listen for five minutes. So this protocol can only be done by people who can identify all these species by ear. And um, I was gonna, I decided not to mess with the sound effects. <laughs> I wasn't sure the computer could, would do it, but the, all of these marsh birds have very interesting, weird, 
kooky sounding calls. Um, and you have to be able to identify all these little grunts and, you know, there's one of them I swear it sounds like a toy horn being blown. And uh, yeah, there's, there's some weird noises they make. But anyway, you gotta be able to identify this. And they all, all of them have kind of a broad range of calls they do. Um, you gotta be able to identify them. So first step anyway is just listen passively for five minutes. And then you begin a playback sequence. 30 seconds of a target species vocalizations followed by 30 seconds of silence, and then 30 seconds of the next target species, 30 seconds of silence. So you go through all eight species, so that's four minutes, and then there is a uh, rest period at the very end in case you get some latecomer chiming in at that point. So then during the survey, you record um, anything, any of this target species you see or hear, way more likely to hear them than to see them. Very rarely you will see them. Some species, the like Virginia rails, will come right up to where you're broadcasting, and they will come within sight. Um, but many of the others will not. But they may flush, they may get up and fly away or fly towards you. But again, if you're in emergent marsh, visibility is pretty limited. Typically, you don't see things that are in amongst the cattails. Um, so primarily, you're listening. So you record all that stuff as well as the conditions, various, oops, things about the conditions, um, weather, how much background noise there is, because that can change if it's a very windy day. You're actually not supposed to do the protocol if it's too windy. Um, and also you don't do it in the rain because you can't hear as well. Um, anyway, each of the designated points is visited three times during the breeding season. Um, which runs from the late May in to early <coughs> into the marsh. And I will say, Chris Lumberg, the guy in the kayak in the front picture, is the one who's done all of the actual in the marsh part. I just am the desk jockey, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so uh, Chris is the one who gets out there at dawn, paddles to these points, and uh, primarily does by kayak. There are a couple that can be accessed by land. Um, but so yeah, here's, uh, this isn't going to show up real well. Over the years, um, we have, and since the last couple of years we've kept the same set of points, we've pretty much got all the marsh habitat sort of carpet bombed with, <laughs> with, with points, so we can't really squeeze in anymore. And this is actually, uh, the points are closer together than they should be per the protocol. Um, and so for real, the best analyses, we're going to end up having to drop some points, I think. Um, for the purpose of some of the summaries that I'm going to show you, I'm going to group up uh, the, some of these points into four areas. Head of the bay, which is all the way down here. We have a set of points there. Leo's Landing. And I, I, some of this is because I know that the other projects are focusing on these areas. So we wanted to have um, the bird data to go with them. So we have Head of the Bay, Leo's Landing. This is what I'm calling the Core Lagoons area. Um, it's the biggest, most extensive um, wetland complex on the park. And uh, although it is broken up by tree lines, those ridges that run into it, it's still, it's got the biggest amount of habitat. Niagara Pond is out here. Um, and then all the other ones, uh, relatively few of our target species have been seen at any of those other points that aren't in those four locations. Um, so I'm actually going to show some summaries of results, which <laughs> uh, it's hard to do sometimes when you're doing this monitoring year after year. And I finally I decided this year, I've um, got six years of, of detection data and I need to actually show some results to this audience. Um, normally, I just talk about the methods, and there's just a few little anecdotes about the results. But here's some actual numbers. Um, first thing I realize is I'm going to have to get a lot better at occupancy modeling for doing real statistical analyses. So uh, this is a call out to the RSC uh, audience out there. Anybody? Do we have statistical people who can help me with my, uh, some of this? 
<laughs> something that maybe we should consider doing with the RSC is talking statistics and who can help who with what stats. Um, so, uh, but this is total detections. Um, the uh, the species are ranked in terms of uh, total detections over the course of the six years of monitoring. The least bittern is absolutely the most abundant or most frequently detected of the um, species we survey for. Uh, at the bottom of the column, you'll see how many points we surveyed and then how many total visits. That means, so this is a measure of effort because each point gets visited either two or three or sometimes four times during the reading season. Um, this number of visits is, is a measure of effort. And as you can see, we, we're, we're putting in much more effort now than we used to do it as a proportion. Um, least bitterns, really abundant. Common gallinules, also pretty abundant. Um, Virginia rails, there's a real trend here and the number of detections going up through the years. They're coming in for sure. Pike Bill Grebe, the, uh, the bottom three here are just sort of blinking and out. Some years we don't have them, some years we do. Um, and I would say there's no clear trends here, except, you know, I think, well, I'll mention this later. I think these are the years with the highest water lake levels. And I do think that had an effect um, for some of these marsh birds. Uh, but in any case, these bottom three species are relatively uncommon. These upper three are fairly abundant here. Um, all right, I'm going to go into the individual species now. And this is a, sort of some, uh, again, pretty crude numbers. I got to get more sophisticated in the analyses. But over time, um, least bitterns. I, this is probably a bit of an outlier at this point up here, so um, don't read too much into it. But I will say, notice that Leo's Landing, basically, these bitters are not using Leo's Landing at this point. The core lagoon area is this uh, yellowish line that goes right through, well, here. Again, that was a probably, uh, I'm not sure why that was quite that high, but we had the fewest number of points and the fewest visits, recall, so the least data volume went into that point uh, compared to other years. Um, but I would say that overall, again, I'm not going to draw any big conclusions, but by the holly, it looks like the numbers are going down. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> uh, but we got to do better stats on it. So um, detection frequency of common gallinules. Um, this is, you know, the only year we didn't have any at this site, head of the bay, was the year that um, we had the highest water levels. And you guys know that those cattail islands out there, you know, the purple martin roosting islands, <laughs> they kind of get drowned out there that year. And I think that was actually a really important uh, habitat for them nesting. And so I, don't, I think that's why that, there's that big dip in that line there. Um, Leo's Landing, though, again, it's they were there early, but they haven't been there for a while now. Um, overall, this red line, all the detections through all our points, um, is they're holding their own, basically, is what it looks like. Now, here's the, here's the good news. <laughs> There's more Virginia rails now than there have been. Uh, and so they are coming up, and I do think you know, my sort of intuition, my bird brain intuition about this is that um, the, these rails are very short. <laughs> they have short legs. They're a small bird. And I think opening up um, the vegetation to create more open patches and shorter vegetation patches, sedge meadow type patches, I think really helps these smaller birds out. Um, because they're, unlike the least, least bitterns, uh, like that picture I showed of the one holding on to the stem, they fish or feed by holding on to emergent stems, and they can use the fragmites just fine for that. Uh, these other guys don't. They walk on the ground in between the cattails. Um, okay, so um, they're going up. Just a few words on the, the other three species that are in Cape Wood, the coot. Um, we actually 
They tend to be concentrated up here, although we had one here in 2019. But this head of the bay habitat where there's deeper water, um, assist, you know, uh, uh, adjacent to the uh, cattails or emergent marsh for now, I think is what um, really helps these guys. Uh, pipe milk grebe, same thing. We had one up here in Niagara Pond, and actually Brian Berktold took a picture of a young one in this pond here one year. can't remember what year that was. Um, but in general, we mostly get them up there at that head of the bay. Um, so they are, I think, using that habitat best. Um, Sewer is an interesting case. Like I said, it was away. It went away for a couple of years. This is where it was. Um, Early, uh, in the first couple of years of the survey, actually this is from 2011, I don't have a good slide with this one, um, but it, then um, this year it came back, it's been now back for the first time in a few years, and so uh, they are again using this uh, core wetlands habitat in the lagoons area. So, uh, we still have lots of least bitterns. That is the good news. This is the locations where the least bitterns were found this year. Um, they are concentrated in that core lagoon habitat area, abundant in there. We did get one in Ridge Pond this year. Uh, and we, this year we only had the two in Niagara. Normally there's more than that there. Um, so that's, Okay, I gotta wrap it up. Um, so, conclusions. There are no American bitters or king rails yet. We can hope, right? Um, the sores have come back after being absent for a couple of years. Virginia rails have definitely increased in their numbers over the past six years. Um, the trends for all the other species, I think I'm gonna try to get some more sophisticated statistical analyses done on that. Uh, it's kind of tricky data. It's, Got to use special non-normal type techniques with uh, because there's a lot of zeros, a lot of surveys. There's nothing there, um, and I do think that the lake, lake levels have had an effect on the territory selection um, and nest habitat selection for these birds. Um, and other habitat characteristics are likely very important to these guys. And I did have done uh, we EBO has done several two different passes of sampling vegetation in all of the 50, within 100 meters of all of the 57 survey points. Um, and um, we did that once in 2020 and once in 2022. And we do things like looking at within a five meter radius uh, at 10 different locations within the 50, or within the 100 meters of the uh, Marshbird point. We uh, do an estimate of amount of cover of different types of things and um, also presence or absence of invasives. So we'll keep doing the vegetation and we'll keep doing the marsh bird surveys until this, while we have the funding. Okay. And that is the surprise pond for the birds. People call it Thompson's Pool, but surprise pond's a good name too. <laughs> All right, that's all. And uh, thanks to everybody. Chris did all the, the slogging, mm -hmm. putting up with the bugs, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the financial support came through the same program that has supported the other stuff. And thanks for the state park, and thanks to the other partners for the various components of things that they do. Thanks. We have time for one quick question. So we're going to talk too long. Yeah, Mark? Um. So you said bitterns haven't returned. Does that mean they're not being observed at all? I, I saw one. American? Yeah. During migration, they're here. They definitely migrate through. Um, they definitely are using these habitats for migration. They are not here during the nesting season. They, uh, if they were here for breeding season, we would, we would have picked up on it. They, they do respond. And they have a very distinctive call. Oh, yeah. Very distinctive call. <laughs> But they are definitely using the peninsula during the spring and fall. Yeah, I have my best view of what I've ever this year. So. Yeah, yeah. So all works, all those things, all all things you know, your list are, uh, you know, or suspect they're reading from the Presque Island? Are all those birds reading from the Presque Island? Or? 
The ones that we are documenting are definitely breeding here in yes. yep. I'm sorry. That was like one quick question. Um, this is the <laughs> second question. Oh, that's okay. I'm still when, doing this. You know, like if we see an American bittern like in May, okay, I, how do we know if it's migrating or breeding? Or? Um, you don't right then, but if it's not here in June, then you know it's migrating. Okay. And so, because well, we can, if Chris hears one in May, he, they don't. Typically, the migrants are not calling. Um, and so they're quiet. So if you hear one, you can suspect. If you hear one and, you, and it stays um, for several weeks, then good chance it's nesting. But, um, that's the kind of thing we would need. I was just carrying the area. Yeah. Because I have seen one too. Yeah. Yeah. No, we definitely I've seen them. Yeah. They're here, but they're passive. They're not. Reason. All right. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Bob White from Penn West University in California. Um, and he is going to talk to us about the plant monitoring that has been conducted during this wetland restoration project. Bob? Thank you, Good morning, and, and I have to apologize. I'm the one in the back that's been coughing all morning. No coughing over here, so I do apologize. For the record, Holly and everyone else who is still in my picture. <laughs> I'm the one that took this picture. I took it back in 2013. It's out at Thompson's Bay, and it's a former student of mine, not an intern. Uh, her name is Kelsey Powers. Poor Kelsey has probably no idea that for the last eight years, <laughs> uh, but it was a great picture. She's PowerPoint famous. She is power and I haven't talked to her in several years, so if I ever do get old, she's from Erie, so maybe she has red hair. If she takes the cap off. If you ever see or run into Kelsey Powers, let her know that she is is famous. So with that, with that said, um, <clears throat> unlike the, the Sarah's talk that you just heard, uh, I have no results that I'm going to give you. This is going to be a very unscientific talk, not a quantitative talk, no graphs, no statistics. But I'm going to use this as an opportunity more to educate about what is out at Prescott from a vegetation standpoint, a general overview, how maybe a few things have, have changed. But again, an education opportunity to talk about wetlands. From my perspective, wetlands are something you all know the term wetlands. If I were to ask you to define what a wetland is, You'd be like one of my students, it's land that's wet, and you wouldn't be wrong. But there's so much more to it. So I'm going to kind of um, go through this talk from that, that standpoint. A lot of what I have here, you've heard. We've had some wonderful talks, and so hopefully I'll add a little bit to it, but a lot of it you, you've already heard. <coughs> the um, things that I, I want to talk about, you can see, see here. And I'll talk about the monitoring, why we monitor, because it's very important to understand why we monitor. And you've heard a number of talks, whether it's birds, whether it's other uh, aspects of the biota here at Presque Isle, but we can't just go out and manage and treat without knowing what the results are. We have to use those monitoring results to our our changing out here. And um, I'm going to go through a number of the invasives and number five new threats. Uh, somebody asked, I think Holly, I don't remember who it was, a question about some things we need to be looking for. There are some, some new threats that we need to keep our eye open for, and so I'll briefly mention those, and then what are we going to, uh, to do next over the next, the next few years. So hopefully you can, you can see this okay. I want to I wanna present a picture of Presque Isle, maybe in a, in a way that you haven't seen before. So this is a map that I constructed from the National Wetland Inventory. And so Presque Isle might be a six mile plus long sand spit, but it's pretty much all wetland. So on Presque Isle, wherever you go, you have wetlands. And so everything that you see here from most of, of the green to all of this blue, this is all different types of wetlands. Uh, we have mostly what we're gonna we'll call blustering emergent wetlands out here. We have scrub shrub wetlands out here. We have a few forested wetlands out here, but Presque Isle is the wetland. Um, I'm guessing, I haven't quantitatively um, figured this out, but I just kind of took a guess, 60, 70 percent, if not more, of Presque Isle is all wetlands. And so when we're out there and we're working in these wetlands, it's a great opportunity 
to interact with the public and talk about these wetlands. And we do interact with the, with the public. We have so many that will come up and ask us what we're doing. We have a number of people from the public that like to come up, steal our equipment unknowingly, and walk away with it, so we get to talk to them from that standpoint <laughs> as, as well. It's expensive equipment. But we love these interactions with the, with the public. So I want you to look at this and appreciate all the different wetlands that are, that are out there. This is another way to, to look at Presque Isle and the wetlands. This is a map that we constructed showing all the orange that you see out here. Ignore the green for a second. These are all hydric soils. So when we talk about a wetland, we're talking about the hydrology, you have to have the water. We talk about the soils, hydric soils. These are saturated soils, anaerobic soils, and then the vegetation is adapted to living in, in these unique conditions. So you can kind of see a pretty good idea of where it's wet out there. Most of the green you see is all water. I do a very bad job of outlining Presque Isle, so we're all into the, uh, the near shore as well, but there's a lot of water on the inland. And then the ponds that are actually on Presque Isle, some of these ponds will show up as not being hydric because I'm not a soil scientist, full, full disclaimer, but if you have a deep enough um, body of water, all that muck and substrate is not considered soil. Um, again, I'm not a soil scientist, so it doesn't all show up, but you can see the extent of the wetlands that are on, on Presque Isle. So it, it's kind of interesting. And then this helps guide us as we look at different areas as, as well when we're, we're looking where we're going to, where we're going to sample. All right. Why do we monitor? So I'm not going to go through all this, but real quickly I just want to point out so one funding. They, they want us to monitor, so if they're going to pay us to monitor, we're going to go out and we're obviously going to monitor, but there's a number of key things. Are we effective in what we're doing? So Holly talked about the management, the, the treatment that's going on for the invasive plant species in, in these wetlands. Is it effective? Uh, if you've been out here and looking at um, Presque Isle and the wetlands for the last 10 years plus, you know it's highly effective. It looks so much different out here now than it has. You, you've heard these other talks. We can see the changes that are going on. So it's, it's very, very effective. And we need to do this in terms of where are other invasives going to come in? Where do we need to follow up? We have to prioritize. And, and this is, I talked about the limited funding. So when I'm out there doing the monitoring, I'm very fortunate. I've had a number of people from the interns to the staff uh, who have helped. Um, Jen Salem and, and, and all the other staff have been out there to help me. But I'm a one-person show. I've had, I've had a couple summers where I'm the only one that's been out there doing the monitoring, and it's hard to do when you're one person. There's, you've already seen the map of all the wetlands that are out there. So we have to prioritize what are the areas that we're going to get in and sample. Where's the biggest bang for our buck in terms of seeing, noting what the changes are and are the efforts that, are, um, that Holly and her, her crew funding might stop. I know Holly doesn't want to hear that, Jeanette doesn't want to hear that, and it could change, but if you're, and Holly calls it an epic war, it's, it's, it can't stop. I mean, the invasives aren't going away. They're, they're here to stay. So when you, when you manage, you control, you follow, uh, do the monitoring, you have to prioritize. Draw that line in the sand, all right, we've lost it here, but this is where we're going to control and we're going to make sure it never gets. To, to this part. So we have to monitor, and it, it's a critical aspect of what we do. How do we set, set up the monitoring? We've been doing this now for, for over 10 years. So we kind of have this protocol in, in, in which we, we do this, but we're at the point now where we're pretty much from assess straight down to monitoring, because we, we designed what we're doing, we, we've implemented it, so we're pretty much circling, we evaluate, we adjust what we're doing, we might change. Uh, from year to year we, where we're looking. I might sit down with Holly and say, all right, are there particular areas that you want me to get into this year and monitor and look for, look for changings, changes? And so each year we might look for different, different places that we're going to go to. But it's pretty much a straightforward process. As I said, we have limited, re excuse me, we have limited resources. So how we monitor is, is critical. Am I doing everything that I'd like to out there? No. Um, if you come back next year for this, for this talk, I'm probably going to give you a much more scientific talk and I'll get into the specific methods. I'll actually give you results and we can see the numbers and how things have changed. And it's really interesting um, to look at that scientific aspect, the quantitative, the results of what's going, what's going on, that we can tell that story through our, through our monitoring. 
but limited resources. So we have to be realistic in what we can do. So as an example, I run Transex most years, but I don't run them every year. What we do every year at a minimum is an intensive walkthrough through all of our sites and we document everything we see. Do we get all the plants? Probably not. We, we miss some. But we try to document everything that, that we see and take notes on that. And then we will run, I run the transects, divide the area up. We run paired half meter squared. I don't run meter squared for the simple reason that I'm often doing this by myself. It's time consuming. And then you've heard about looking at cover. Well, I do cover, we look at all the species, but I also like to do density because I want that data, and that takes even more time, and I probably shouldn't, shouldn't do density, but I, I like to do it for a lot of species. So it takes time to do all this work, so we really do have to prioritize what we do. Where do we sample? So we pretty much try to cover all of Presque Isle, um, from, from the, um, all the way down from when you enter Presque Isle, and we even were able to get out in 2020, all the way out to, um, to the tip, to Gull Point, and we, and I'm saving this for the end. We actually um, ran into another plant that has not been found on uh, <clears throat> Presque Isle before. Whether or not you consider it an invasive, I'm talking about American water lotus, is up for debate, but I'll uh, save that for the end if I have, have that much time. But again, we've been 2012 to present. We have a number of sites. We added some more sites in 2016. Uh, we had a dead pond in, in, I believe, 2016, but we've only been, we've only monitored that twice, so we're going to follow up in the coming year. This past year, 2022, we did not monitor at, at all for reasons that I, I won't get into. We've also looked at some other aspects. We've done some DNA testing on the Phragmites, and what we found was that from all the way here to all the way out here, it's all from the same plant. There's no change in, in the DNA, so when we did that genetic testing, and we, that wasn't a surprise to us at all. But you've heard about seed bank work. We also started doing seed bank work back in 2012 to 2016. Incredibly time-consuming work. That's why I'm not the one doing it anymore. Uh, it needs a lot of space, a lot of time, and it, was, it wasn't really showing us anything in terms of unique plants that we hadn't seen. Now, since the, um, the cleanup of the invasives, we're seeing a number of state-listed plants. Presque Isle has more state-listed plants than any park in the, in the state, and we are starting to, to see them. I'm not going to show them all to you today, um, but, but they're out there. This, this kind of gives you a good perspective. This is not my slide. This is a slide from a student. I don't know the student, so I apologize. Um, Bob Harris. Bob Harris was a wonderful volunteer out here that helped me quite a bit. He gave me the, uh, the presentation from this, this student, the PowerPoint, and this is a, from 2010, so we started really in 2012, but he tried to document, it's hard to see all the yellow, the blue, uh, and there's also, I think some, I can't see up there, but there's another color up there as well. But you can see Phragmites pretty much extended throughout the park. They're not showing you all in here pretty much because some of these areas are very difficult to get to. But as of 2010, Phragmites was everywhere. In 2011, we were supposed to do some pre-monitoring, but we weren't able to start until late in the year, so we weren't able to get out there in 2011 to do pre-monitoring, and Holly and her crew so effective, 2012, they were already out there um, doing everything. So they, they could not wait on me to do pre-monitoring, so we really don't have that pre-monitoring data that we would have liked. But as you'll see in a second, we have something which is almost as, as good. If, if not better. So we, the extent of the problem, we, we know that Phragmites was everywhere, and that's what we're focusing on, Phragmites, but then I'm gonna follow up with everything else, because as Holly said, once you remove the Phragmites, I think Holly did this on purpose, because now it's even more work, because all the new invasives, and there are a lot of new invasives that are shown. This is a map from, uh, from Jennings' um, original paper when he published the vegetation. So you're talking about turn of the century, and I don't mean 2000, I'm talking about 1900. And I always have to say that whenever I say turn of the century. And Prescott Isle looked a little bit different, but the, most, of the, um, most of the sand spit was documented for the vegetation. And we have all of this information. So this was from, I believe, I'm gonna tell you 1909, but I'm not, the, the base map itself is 1903 but I believe he did his initial work for what we're seeing here in 1909, but I'm really bad at dates, so I have to go back and, and check that. So we have a really good base, and then from there going forward, 
of what's out there. Uh, but we didn't have an invasive problem back then, and we can talk about that, that as well. But we have an incredible wealth of documents as to what's gone on at Presque Isle since the, actually since the 18, 1800s. You can't read this, I know, and I wasn't going to blow it up so you could, but I'll talk about it real, real quickly. But we have all of the records from the 1800s to present day of what's been found at Prescott. Now, I can't go back for a lot of it and verify whether it was accurate or not. A lot of it we can. We we'll have the museum here that, uh, from what Mark has. Carnegie Museum of Natural History has a lot of these records, and we have utilized those records quite a bit to verify what we're finding. But if you look, for, for example, um, here's Potomagetan um, Profoliatus, a pondweed. We have quite a large community of Potomagetans out here. This is a state-listed plant. And it's in abundance out here at Presque Isle. But I think the year on this is, again, I can't read from here. This one might have been the early 1900s, but we have some from the, eight, from the 1800s. And then if you look at this record, it says Phragmites Australis, that's 1800 and something. I can't, I can't read the date. So you're saying Phragmites Australis, Phragmites has been here that long. It's the native Phragmites, which I don't know if we even have any more of the native plant out here. Uh, and it is difficult um, to tell them apart, so it can inadvertently have been sprayed as well, but I know we would never do that. So, but as you can see, we have these records really dating back to a long time. I'm going to ignore you. All right, and then also, you heard from Jen in terms of the plantings. Well, here's an article from 1940 that they were doing plantings, getting ready to do plantings out at Presque Isle. So, so Jen and her crew are not the first to alter what, what's going on out here. I'm not going to go through these. Uh, this is misspelled. That should be obtusa. These are all the different invasive plant species of concern, and a number of these have all been showing up in much greater abundance ever since we made the mistake of getting rid of all the phragmites. No, it was not a mistake. So we get rid of the phragmites, and lo and behold, all these other things. These are the submergent for the most part, and they're a problem out in the inner, inner lagoon. So we've talked a lot about Phragmites. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's, it's a native plant, but what we have is actually the, the European Asian genotype of, of Phragmites, which is much more aggressive. It grows in what I'll call near monocultures. It looks like a monoculture, but you get into it, and there's actually a lot more diversity than you think, but not what it, what it should be. Um, so why is it so invasive now? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, probably water levels are the is the trigger. So when water levels dropped as we got into the year 2000, all these isolated pockets of Phragmites now exploded everywhere. And we saw that all, of, all throughout the Great, the Great Lakes. And we're not going to get rid of it now, but we can knock it back. And there's a number of distinct characteristics. It's good to know these invasive plants and the characteristics because you want to be able to manage and appropriately treat them. Where we're at now is that these large extensive stands, as you saw in that, that first picture, Holly and her crew have done a great job. They're down to these isolated fragments of Phragmites. And as water levels came up, they're now being held in check. As water levels drop, if they drop, um, and if we don't control these isolated, this is the follow-up work, it's just going to explode all over again. So that's something that we need to look at and control these isolated small stands. So I threw this picture up. Uh, here's a low bridge. And this was, la I believe this was last year, or the year before. Up until last year, up until then, whenever I would kayak or canoe under this bridge, I had to lean all the way back without, not to hit my head. And so when we were doing some plant ID training, and the interns thought it'd be fun just to walk all the way, all the way under, but water levels had dropped. The, they, are, they are still high, but it shows you water levels control what we're seeing with respect to the different, different plants. Typha, uh, we have the native typha, we have the hybrid, we have the narrow leaf, and it's important to, to, to know what they look like. I'm not going to get into that, uh, but the interns and those who are treating it, if you can't distinguish between typha angustifolia and the native typha latifolia, you're going to wipe this out as well. And actually, when we started treating, we did wipe out all the, the native cattail. It has now come back from the, from the seed bank. And so we do have good populations coming back. But the narrow leaf cattail is a definite problem. And again, there are those who will tell you that these three are now so interspersed that there's really no distinction from a genetic standpoint between the three. Oh, I lied. I do have, I do have one graph. 
And I wanted to show you in terms of typha, um, typha release. So if you look down here, this is from Leo's landing. And if we're looking at what we call importance values, Phragmites was, as you can see, this is from 2012. By 2014, Leo's landing, there was no more Phragmites outside of a few isolated. Typha slowly started to in increase. And then uh, it has been treated. But you can see, and then here is Typha latifolia. This is the first native stand that we found back out of Thompson's roadside where it started to, started to come back. And I will start to wrap up here. <laughs> um, so let me kind of go through. Again, reed canary grass is another um, plant that has exploded. But there are native grasses that look very similar. Um, blue joint, Calamagrostis. So we need to be able to distinguish between these plants. And so it's important to know what the invasives are. Lithum salicaria, purple loosestrife is another one. Since we've removed the Phragmites, purple loosestrife is exfoliatus that, that Holly mentioned. We've seen it in the last few years with a rise in water levels. It's starting to, to spread in the near shore areas. Really pretty, pretty plant. Uh, here's the interns pulling. It does pull rather easily compared to something like purple loosestrife. Um, but again, it's something that we need to keep an eye out on. And then the beautiful iris, and Holly and I were talking about this the other day, blue flag. We now have yellow flag starting to show up everywhere. But if that flower is not there, it's really hard to tell the difference. Yeah, there are characteristics that you can look at, but if that flower is not there, you're, not, you're probably not going to tell the difference between them. So again, we don't want a tree. Right. Then we can move into the um, submergence. This is Eurasian water milfoil. This is over in Thompson's Bay. Uh, you can see it's got the feathery leaves, but this is how thick it was. This was a student of mine just picking it up in Thompson's Bay, how, how thick it was. Since we removed the Phragmites, submergence have been coming back, but, uh, <clears throat> but so has um, the Eurasian water milfoil. We did a rake survey of the inner lagoon system. We wanted to see that in terms of all of the submerged species, with all the treatments going on, has, was this having an impact? We've documented, found out there with photographs and specimens for the, for the herbarium. There's an incredible amount of natives out there, but we also have a number of, number of invasives. This is Nitalopsis obtusa, starry stonewort, which is a mountain wrapping up, which is a <laughs> macroalgae. It is from end to end of the inner lagoon system. It is everywhere. And so it was asked about treating for the milfoil, for the starry stonewort. The problem is if you, if you treat for these, you're pretty much also going to take out all of your natives as well. You can see a zebra mussel attached to a, a, two invaders attached. One is attached to the other. And we found the zebra mussels attached to quite a few of the starry stonework that we, that we pulled out. And I'll start to wrap. New invaders, water hyacinth. We pulled this out a couple of years ago from the inner lagoon. Uh, we have, somebody probably dumped it along with, uh, this is what happens if you let water hyacinth go in a lake wall to wall. We pulled it out with water lettuce, southern species down in Florida. It's almost 70 degrees out there today. These plants, a mild winter, can get a foothold in here and they will cause a problem. Frog bit, um, hydrilla, or two others that have, have been found in the Great Lakes, Lake Erie now, over in Ohio, and so they're a problem as well, things that we need to keep an eye on. And then lastly, American water lotus. This is, it's debatable whether it's a native. This is out at the um, Gulf Point at, at the tip. Here's a pond, and you can't see it. It's the end of the year, but it's extensive American water lotus. The seed head, it has rhizomes that extend everywhere. This is how big the leaves can get. This is from Old Woman Creek in Ohio. It was everywhere, just wall to wall. There's no oxygen in that water. There's nothing living in that water. And then to, to wrap up, a lot of this work um, that we're doing monitoring is also working with the interns and the staff for training to make sure that they know what, to know, that they know what they're doing and looking at everything. And so as we look at this, what are we going to do next? Well, we've talked about all the areas where we have the invasives. We also want to, here's an uh, example, Ridge Pond. We want to get into these areas that are difficult to get into, where the invasives have not been, and we want to make sure that they're, they're not there. So starting next year, we'll continue the work. We're going to look at all the areas that have been planted as well, and we're going to survey them and document what's going on in there, which will help us. And with that, I thank everyone, and hopefully I didn't go too long. Either. But thank you very much. switch over presentations if there's one quick question. Any questions? Great. Thank you.
Our next presenter and final presenter for this session is Sean Dalton from the RSC. And so not only is he working on the amphibian monitoring work, he is also our drone pilot. It's taking a long time to look out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't know why it's hesitating. All right, Sean. All right, yes, I'm back. Um, I'm still Sean Dalton. I'm still the lab and field manager of the Regional Science Consortium. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the wetland restoration project mm -hmm. entirely. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the aerial drone surveys that we've done, um, not only along the shoreline of Presque Isle, but in those priority wetland habitats as well, as well as a couple other projects that we've incorporated that work into. Um, also, shout out to Sarah Sargent for her taste in PowerPoint themes. I like your style. <laughs> Um, before I get into the actual projects themselves, I'm going to go over a brief history of northwestern Pennsylvania and Presque Isle for those of you that might not understand why we're looking at the shoreline here. Um, so this entire region of Pennsylvania um, geo geologically was shaped um, in the Wisconsin glacial episode about 23,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand years. Um, so the southern lobe of this glacier, which was known as the Laurentide Ice Sheet, carved out the Great Lakes. Particularly, the lobe that carved out Lake Erie was known as the Lake Erie Lobe, was aptly named. Um, and as you can imagine, when a glacier retreats, anything that it was holding in it, any of those boulders, sand, sticks, stones, all of that sediment is just dropped where that ice melts. Um, that is essentially what happened with um, Lake Erie and Presque Isle. And Presque Isle con it consists entirely of just an unconsolidated sand ridge. Um, so this is an example here of a glacial erratic that you can find a lot of times around the county. Um, if you're ever around and you find a giant rock of granite, um, that's an igneous rock, comes from crystallized magma. I hate to break it to you, but there's no volcanoes around here. All of that stuff came from Canada when it was transferred down here with the glaciers. Um, you can see the extent of that glacier and how the retreat happened and left that whole arc of Great Lakes. There are also lakes that formed under the same circumstances as the five big ones that we know here in the United States. Um, they're farther, farther north up in Canada, they're a lot more cold, but they were formed under these same processes. Um, so as I mentioned, Presque Isle itself is composed enti entirely of unconsolidated sediment, which means it is quite literally a giant pile of sand. There's no geologic structure that gives it its shape. Um, because of this, it has always been subject to the erosive forces of Lake Erie. Um, typically here we get a wind out of the northwest, which results in an angled approach of our waves. Um, as those waves push sediment up onshore, that follows gravity straight back into the lake, and you get this kind of migratory pattern of sand being pushed from west to east here. Because of that, as you can see, the peninsula kind of wants to migrate. And so you can see here in this last figure here, there's this dotted outline of where the predictions of the peninsula were in 1200 AD. Um, so the neck is estimated to be about where uh, the outlet of Walnut Creek is currently. Um, and you can see that there's been breaches historically in the neck of the peninsula. The way it wants to move down the shore is kind of like a big slinky. So the neck would break away, that sediment would be carried to the end, Gull Point wants to continue out, reach to the shoreline, and then it would continue to slinky down the shoreline. Um, Erie being founded here because of the harbor, we have vested interest in preventing that, so there's been all sorts of anti-erosion mitigation structures, such as the break walls that you can see off of the beaches that have been constructed, as well as the one geologic structure that is helping the peninsula out is from about where the end of it is now, west, there is a shallow shale shelf in the lake bed. Um, this, so if you're west of the peninsula and you're going out fishing or something, it takes a couple miles before you're at 60 feet of water. If you go off a hammer mill, it's a couple hundred yards before you're in that depth of water. So another one of the reasons that we want to keep the peninsula where it is, is if that slinking continues into that deeper water, we might lose it entirely. So that brings me to the drone. We use a DJI Phantom 4 Pro V2. This is a pretty typical consumer drone that you could probably go to Best Buy today and pick up one for yourself if you wanted to. Um, right out of the box, it comes with a 60 frame per second 4K camera, which gives really nice pictures and video off of it. Um, but we also have purchased a secondary mount for it for an additional OCN sensor, which stands for Orange, Cyan, and Near Infrared, which allows us to look into different wavelengths of light for different types of analyses. Um, before you can fly the drone for any sort of compensation or on state park land in general, um, you have to have an FAA Part 107A certification. Um, this requires an eight-hour course and a written exam. 
Um, I, I got my certification back in 2020, and my original exam was scheduled for March 18th, which, if anybody remembers, was the day everything in Erie shut down for COVID. Um, so I was kind of thrown into a little bit of a unknown situation there waiting for my test. But eventually, come July 27th, I was able to get my license, and we were able to start doing these things. In the course, you learn all sorts of regulations and stipulations that you have to abide by, such as you're not allowed to operate the drone over anybody that's not affiliated with your mission, which, as you can imagine, poses some problems when you're trying to survey public beaches that receive over 4 million visitors per year. Um, so generally, when we're doing things like that on the beach, we have to get out there first thing in the morning before any people are there so that we're able to get our jobs done without having any sort of interference. Um, in addition to that, we are located in relatively close proximity to the Erie Airport. Um, with the size and class of the airport that Erie is, they have a five mile straight radius from their control tower that you're not allowed to operate the drone in. Um, so that does take up a bit of portion of the peninsula. So you can see so far we've gotten all the way out from Gull Point just past the lighthouse over here, as well as our Thompson's Bay restoration site out there. Um, so one of the big reasons that we're looking at the shoreline in particular um, is the formation of these uh, structures known as tumbolos. Um, you may have seen them. Um, if you're ever out on the beach, sometimes the sand will form a spit almost out to the middle of that break wall. Um, what's happening there actually is as the waves come in between two openings in the break wall, they're split into two separate wave patterns, and on the uh, inshore side of that break wall where the waves come together, they'll cancel out their energy and all that sediment just drops out of the water column. As that continues through the year, you get these tumbolos that bridge out, and they will actually reach all the way out there so you can walk straight out to the tumbolos and walk over top of them. Um, the problem with that is that sediment source that wants to continue traveling down Lake Erie, when you put a wall in the way of it, you've now cut off that entire sediment source. So now that down current side is just eroding and you lose that beach very rapidly. This is an image of one of our priority wetland habitats. Um, so with this, we can not only get um, very high resolution imagery on the same day of our wetland sites. So the drone is actually capable of, generally my resolution is um, one pixel in the image is about two centimeters in real life. Um, so you can really zoom in on this imagery and get a lot of detail. Um, but then that secondary sensor also comes in that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, just to illustrate though that tumbolo um, erosion that I was talking about, down here on the bottom this is a satellite image of uh, the Beach 9 area from 2012. Um, this is drone imagery overlaid that in 2020, and you can see once this tumbolo has formed, almost this entire area of beach here has been eroded. Um, so DCNR will actually go out there with a lot of excavators and dig those out to prevent this from happening, and then that sand is then recycled into the replenishment sources for the beaches. Um, this is another interesting area on the park. park. This is just west of Gull Point on the beaches. Um, so you can see just the amount of erosion that has actually happened along that shoreline from 2012 to 2020. Um, if you measure that, that's about 70 yards of a southern retreat of the shoreline. That being said, that sediment is still going somewhere, and you can see how much is collecting here. I don't have a full view of the entirety of the sediment that is out there at Gull Point yet, just because there's a lot of restrictions there with the migratory birds and access of when I'm able to actually get out there and fly. Um, but there is more sand south of there. So it is still out there, it's just in different areas. Um, this is our wetland area restoration site at Thompson's Bay. Um, on the bottom here you can just see the lack of detail when you're taking a satellite image versus how much detail there is with the actual drone footage. So this can be helpful just to have up-to-date maps to show people of what the sites look like. But then further that goes into this OCN sensor. Um, so what this other sensor allows me to do is create something that's known as a normalized difference vegetation index. Um, quite literally what this is, is it's just a way of normalizing all the vegetation you have within your image, applying a color code to it, a scale of one to five, so you can see the relative health between um, vegetation. Um, so due to photosynthesis, um, plants really absorb a lot of light in the visible spectrum, and they reflect green pretty much. As the, the, the main uh, wavelength that they reflect, so you see them as green, and they're absorbing all, nearly all infrared light. If Holly and her interns go out there and spray them with um, herbicide, that next day they probably would look blue, but mostly the same in terms of health. 
This sensor, what it's able to do, since it's looking at that near-infrared light, they're actually then that soon reflecting more of that. So if you look at the images through that sensor, the vegetation looks totally different and stressed compared to healthy vegetation that has not been hit by an herbicide or any other stressor. Um, traditionally, this is performed with a red-green and near-infrared sensor. However, this company that we um, went with has a new version of that sensor where it kind of expands the, the bandwidth that it's looking at and it gives you more contrast within those um, fields. So you can see this would be the traditional range that it would be looking at in the wavelength of light. And if you make those a little bit wider, you can see just how much more contrast within that image you would have compared to the normal um, traditional means of doing this analysis compared to the visible light, what you would see with your naked eye. So there's a lot more information you can tease out about the vegetation health when you're looking at it within these, within these wavelengths. Um, so in addition to these sites that we're looking at on the park, um, we have also started working at a uh, field station in South Carolina at a location known as Bay Point Island. Um, this is an uninhabited, privately owned barrier island located near Hilton Head. Um, it is privately owned and its plans to be developed into a small uh, eco-community. Um, and so we've been going down there to monitor impact pre, during, and post-development in order to minimize that impact. Um, so this island has all sorts of cool things on it, including a beach um, that has a designated important bird area, sea turtles nest there, um, there's all sorts of other cool wildlife and things that you find along there too. So this is an image of just the um, Island itself, um, South Carolina DNR has a really good uh, system where they do aerial photography of the whole area about every two years. Um, so this is an image from 2020. That being said, this area experiences the same kind of longshore current that we do here on the peninsula. However, in this area, it's more of a north to south transfer of the sand as opposed to the west to east that we see here. Um, the important bird area is located out on the end of this lagoon arm here and sea turtles nest all along this beach. And because of that longshore current, it is also extremely dynamic, just like the peninsula is. Um, so I've started doing some droning out there. Um, I've been down three times so far, and it's usually limited in the amount of time that we have there. And because of all the weather things and stuff like that, you're not always able to get perfect flights. I've had pretty good luck while we've been down there so far. Um, I haven't completed this lagoon arm because it's a lot bigger than it seems when you're actually there. Um, but I do know it has connected all the way there. And every satellite image you look at this location is totally different. So it's really one of my top goals to actually get what the full shoreline looks like out there. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the drone imagery versus the satellite imagery looks like, I'm going to focus in on this area up here. Um, so this is only a difference of about a year. Um, and you can see just how different the drone imagery looks and how much more detail you can get. So it's very valuable every time that you go there pretty much to do a new flight because you'll see something new in terms of the landscape. Um, another one of the really fun projects that we did recently um, was the Pennsylvania Game Commission and DCNR had a controlled burn out at Erie Bluff State Park. Um, this kind of just happened pretty short notice for me. Uh, Holly said, hey, you want to fly the drone over it and make us some educational videos? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the goal of this was to really control a lot of invading cool season vegetation as well as other pests like ticks. Um, so we went out with the drone while they were doing it and we filmed it. Um, so here are some of the pictures that you can see of it, just some, kind of the patterns. And it was really, really cool to see how actually controlled it is um, and how that extended. So I did add in a short little video of that so you can actually see what the fire looks like. Um, but it was a really cool and powerful educational tool that we were able to create. Very impressive too when you're actually there. <laughs> yeah, that was, the, that was the most surprising part about it for me was how loud it was. So the image processing itself, that video I just showed you was manually flying and that's just a video that's saved on a micro SD card. Um, but for most of the things like creating the maps of the shoreline, um, those are pre-programmed missions that I use on iOS, any iOS supported device. It's quite literally, it looks like you open up a GPS, but you can draw a square, click start mission, and it'll put your paths in. You can twist those around for how you want the drone to fly, and you upload it, and you literally press start, and you just have to make sure it doesn't run into anything. It'll take off, it'll land itself, it takes all the photos. Um, 
There's an accompanying website that goes along with the app that you just upload all the imagery to and it mosaics it for you. Um, the really powerful part about this is I've literally gone out in the morning and had a map after lunch. Um, when you're looking at traditional remote sensing data gathering, you have to contact somebody that owns a satellite, pay them, and then wait for the satellite to be over the area that you want to look at. And you're not necessarily going to get two centimeters per pixel resolution. Um, so the addition of this has been a very powerful tool in terms of remote sensing data collection. That being said, it's not always perfect. There are a lot of difficulties that go along with it. Um, weather obviously can be pretty unpredictable. Um, the drone itself is still an electronic device, so you don't want to fly it outside in the rain or anything like that. That's a good way to you know, short it out. Uh, I can't operate over people unaffiliated with the mission. Battery time, um, we have three batteries currently that last about 30 minutes each, so I can fly for about an hour and a half if conditions are perfect. Um, which is fairly decent, but we're looking to expand that so that we're able to get more done in a day. Um, wind speed is a very tricky one, particularly when you're on the shoreline of Presque Isle. Um, what you feel on the beach is not necessarily what the wind speed is 400 feet up in the air. Um, the drone itself can't fly in anything that exceeds one-third of its maximum velocity. So when I'm flying a mission that's generally around any wind speed that's sustained more than 10 or 15 miles an hour, is generally a little bit too much for it. Um, so you just have to keep an eye on that. And I've had days where it's super windy on the beach and there's nothing up there and the drone says it's fine and I've had the exact opposite as well where you think it's a totally calm day but once you get up in the air it's getting whipped all over the place. Um, controlled airspace again, like I mentioned, um, some of our habitat restoration sites do fall very um, far back or west on the neck of the peninsula. Um, so some of those sites we have not been able to get drone footage of just because we can't send it up high enough to clear the vegetation and get reliable imagery from it. Um, time of year is also a challenge. Um, so the optimal time to do something like an NV NDVI analysis would be early July when plants are really in their full health. Um, that also happens to fall into the time of year where we're the most busy, busy with our other monitoring projects and things like that. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like there's not enough hours in the day and the years just fly by and before you know it, you've missed the window when you can actually get out there and look at what the plants are looking like. Um, and as well as COVID-19, we're kind of past that at this point, but I'm a little scarred about having to wait for my test. That was not fun. <laughs> um, so going forward, our future plans are to continue to update this database of the shoreline conditions, both here and Bay Point Island. Um, the RSC also has our full buoy fleet that's out in the water, so we're able to compare that storm data to what we're seeing on the shorelines. Um, continue making these NDVI analyses of these habitat restoration areas. As you do this from year to year, you can really pull out trends of what the vegetation is doing there um, and where you might need to focus in the future for more um, control efforts. That shoreline in South Carolina for hurricane impact, because that is an important migratory bird and sea turtle habitat area, and pretty much any unique opportunity that arises, just like the control burn that came in. Um, another example of this was when we were down in South Carolina, an herp a herpetologist was with us. We were at a pond and we were wondering if there were gator nests out in it. And we said, hey, let's just send it up and look. It's like, I'm not getting in that water. Um, <laughs> and other things like that. I know Sarah Sargent had contacted me in the past about potentially doing things like counting ducks and other <clears throat> sorts of marsh birds like that from, from above. So really, any opportunity that arises, we're down for. Um, Brian Gula actually just came to me yesterday. We we're making plans to go out and get some footage of ice dunes this winter. Um, project partners again. Yeah, do you like that one? <laughs> and I'll take any questions. Um, so the 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 camera comes with a program as well that has all sorts of data for that sort of thing stored. So it's pretty much standardized at this point. Once you take the image, you run it through that model, and it, it just handles that on its own. It's built into the model itself. Yeah. Any plans to get a thermal camera for it? So I am actually currently looking at all the other things that we can strap to it, and I'm still determining what we're going to do next. Um, I don't know if there's one compatible with what we have, 
Um, definitely something I've thought about, as well as I'm thinking it'd be really cool if there was a way to mount LiDAR or something to it. But that's something that's been in my mind for a while, but I don't know if the technology is there yet to strap it onto a drone. But yeah, I'm looking at all sorts of different sensors. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. Um, we have one of the biggest freely available consumer drones on the market, um, as well as my um, certification is only up to a certain weight class. So there is a whole other field of drones that can equ be equipped with much heavier equipment um, that I'm not certified to fly. Um, so I'm kind of seeing where I can work and what the next step within our field of uh, certification is, um, but I have there. They do have fairly large quadcopter drones that I've been reading things about. Even herbicide applications, they're starting to do with them. Maybe. And Matt. Yes. Matt is like a yeah. veteran. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, they still a few. Holly, did you have one? I was just wanting clarification. So, for the artist to be able to do the drone work on the park. They have to have a lot of permits in place, so they have to have a collection, research and collection permit, as well as a letter of authorization, because people are not allowed to buy drones on state parks, except if it's tied to research. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you.